It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. At age 11, today's guest, Dr. Brooke Ellison, was hit by a car, an accident that left her paralyzed from the neck down and dependent on a ventilator. Ten years later, she graduated from Harvard University with a degree in cognitive neuroscience. At 23, she penned Miracles Happen, a memoir that was adapted into a movie, The Brooke Ellison Story, which was directed by Christopher Reeve. Brooke joins us today to talk about the story of her remarkable life and the belief that people possess the strength and grit to fight back when we feel all is lost. Brooke is also the author of Look Both Ways. Welcome, Brooke. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Joan. It's a pleasure to talk to you today. So, Brooke, let's begin by talking a little bit about the accident that occurred to you when you were a child. What happened and what types of injuries did you sustain? Sure. So I grew up uh, on Long Island where I talked to you uh, today. Um, And uh, so as a child, my life was like many other children's uh, growing up in suburbia. I was involved in many extracurricular activities that defined my day, Um, dancing and soccer and karate, the whole gamut. Um, When I was 11 years old, though, I was walking home for uh, for my first day of seventh grade. And to do that, I had to cross a fairly major highway here on Long Island, and I was hit by a car. And the accident generated just tremendous injuries to my body, all sorts of uh, really devastating uh, injuries, including I cracked my skull open, I bit off a third of my tongue, I was in cardiac and respiratory arrest. Um, I was brought to Stony Brook Hospital, where they uh, administered um, uh, immediate Uh, resuscitative measures, and it was highly questionable whether or not I would survive. Um, Fortunately, I did, uh, but the lingering uh, injuries that I had and have until this day um, was uh, damage to my spinal cord, a spinal cord injury, very high up on my spinal cord, so C2 and C3, so high up on the cervical spine, kind of in my neck, uh, which left me paralyzed from my neck down and dependent on a ventilator to breathe. So I spent six weeks in pediatric intensive care at Stony Brook Hospital, just be getting, getting stabilized. Um, when I awoke from the coma that I was in, I didn't know where I was. Um, I didn't quite, I wasn't quite sure what had happened to me, uh, but I knew that things were just catastrophically different. Um, I wasn't really able to talk, but I communicated to my parents in whatever way that I could that I wanted to return to school. That, that was really something that was of utmost importance to me at the time. I spent an additional seven and a half months in rehabilitation, just kind of learning to live with a disability, learning to accommodate a life that I had known to disability, and that was, of course, um, you know, just laden with struggle and uncertainty. Um, but I returned home that following May, so my accident happened in September of 1990, so I missed that entire academic year and uh, returned home that following May after a lot of you know, therapy and you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, that sort of thing to learn to uh, accommodate my life to disability and um Fortunately, I was able to return to school exactly one year from the day of my accident, and that kind of set me on the path for um, my future. It was a hard-fought battle to return to school, but one that uh, my family and I fought very hard to um, you know, to make sure it was a possibility for me, and you know, thankfully that was, and it's been the trajectory that my life has taken ever since, a focus on my education and ways that I could continue to make a difference and contribute to the world in whatever meaningful ways I could. And Brooke, do you remember back when 
you first woke up after the accident and you realized the extent of your injuries, do you remember what was going through your mind? What were you thinking and feeling then? Well, it was it was terrifying for sure. So, so first and foremost, I was in just you know, immense amounts of pain. Um, you know, after you're cracking your skull open and, and biting off a third of your tongue, that was really what I could feel most acutely and you know, obviously. Um, but you know, my body had just suffered traumatic injuries. And uh, you know, on top of that, um, I remember being in the hospital bed and not able to you know, to move my body, not able to to move my neck, or my head, anything, just kind of staring at the ceiling in front of me and um, you not being able to, to vocalize anything. I had so many questions, so many fears, so many uncertainties, and I wasn't able to express any of that. Um, my parents were kind of staring at my face constantly to, to, so the, in the event that I was trying to get their attention or trying to mouth words to them, they didn't want to miss anything that I might, you know, I might see. I didn't know what my life was going to look like. Um, initially, after my accident, I thought for sure that, you know, um, I would be in the hospital for a certain amount of time, you know, a couple of weeks, and that by, by Christmas time, I would be home back with my family and things would be just fine and I would I would exit the hospital the exact way that I came in and that you know I'd just be you know, decorating the Christmas tree and then getting ready for the holidays with my with my family as you know, as we always had um it wasn't until I was moved from pediatric uh, intensive care until to rehabilitation that um it became a lot more obvious that wait a second things are not going to go according to the timeline that I had expected and that uh, I was going to live a life uh, you know for however long I will live you know with disability for um for a lot longer than I ever would have anticipated and that I was going to need to entirely rethink how I approached my sense of purpose and who I was in the world and like that was really difficult when you're only 11 or 12 years old like that is um identity shifting and just like life altering and that was a lot to try to grapple with at such a young age um you know, I missed my my friends and my sister and my brother so desperately at those times I know that my sister and brother came to visit me in the hospital and like it was very difficult for them really emotionally difficult to see their sister um in such a uh, you know a uh, a different state and I know that was the case for also for friends who came to visit me you know there were just only several who were allowed to come up to see me but it was quite devastating for everybody Everybody for sure. Mm-hmm. Brooke, we all have these ideas of the way we believe our life will turn out. And we have these expectations that we set for ourselves. And when things don't happen the way we believe they should, we have a difficult time navigating those challenges or those changes. Mm-hmm. What do you think was your driving force? I mean, your life was dramatically different than the one you had envisioned for yourself. So as you aged in the years past, what do you think was the driving force that kept you going and getting stronger? Thank you. Yeah, when I was a child, you know, I, I was I started dancing when I was just two years old. Um, so I kind of envisioned my life taking that path. I envisioned myself being on Broadway and being a Broadway dancer or, or something. Or I had um, I thought that I would go to Oxford where I would become a lawyer. Like that was kind of the vision that I had for my life. Um, and yeah, I think you're exactly right. We we have these goals that we set for ourselves, and then. We, life throws us these um these curveballs where things go vastly different and it's hard to not envision the path that we had set for ourselves as being the right path right this was the path that we were supposed to be on and some and what would be the course that our lives ultimately take um are some kind of subpar version of what should have been or ought to have been or could have been right i struggled with that for my for you know, for myself you know, for many years and even to this day like there's not a single day that goes by where i don't think oh well, you know, what if you know what if my life you know, what if i didn't cross that road that day or didn't decide to walk home from school that day you know where would where would i be right now what would i be doing but it didn't take long for me to realize that all of those things are purely hypothetical, right? No less real than any other way we can envision our lives. And what we have right now is all that matters. And, you know, it's kind of like um, I, re- I, I felt a sense of responsibility you know, to my family and to my friends, all these people who were um, 
giving me so much support and so much love and and were making changes in their own lives to uh, make sure that my life was as successful as it could be. You know, I had some sense of responsibility to them to you know, hold up my end of the deal here, right, to, to try to find the ways that um, – I could continue to contribute to the world. Um, it, when I was in college, I studied hope and what that means and how that is so delicately tied to the construct of resilience. And when I say hope, you know, like I don't just mean an amorphous um, abstraction that we, you know, wish for or something like that, but you know, a um, a skill set that's built on the knowledge that are, that you know we can have a uh, goals in our lives and uh, recognize the difficulty that we might experience in order to attain those goals, but can still attain them nonetheless. Um, there that we can circumscribe the challenges that we face and not feel like they are all consuming and they're affecting all parts of our lives. And like that, those were lessons that I learned very early on and uh, have relied relied on really every day of my life ever since and I think it's a skill set that we all can benefit from and it's a decision it's a choice that we make it, it you know people sometimes think that this just happens it's a lot of work to decide sure. to focus on the hope and the blessings and the gratitude and that is I believe a conscious decision we make to move our lives forward Oh, my goodness, I couldn't agree more strongly. And that's not to say that, you know, there aren't days where I falter, right, because we all do. We're all human beings, and there are days where I get frustrated and feel like, oh, how come I'm not, I can't do all these other things that my friends are doing. How come I'm not you know, hopping on a plane and going, you know, to this part of the world or the other or, um, you know, jumping in my car and, and you know, doing all the things that, you know, that other people do. Of course, like the, those those feelings of frustration, um, I, I, I get encumbered by those periodically, just like everybody else. But I know that my life as I live it right now is extremely valuable, right? The things that I'm able to do and the lives that I've been able to touch purely because of my disability, because of my accident, like that, that is really important for me to remember. That's something that I think um, is critical to making sure that I, I plot a, pa a path forward for myself, like knowing that um, there are still ways that I can contribute to the world and that you know, I want to seize every opportunity that comes my way to do that. Mm -hmm. You wrote a book, Miracles Happen, and what you're describing just now sounds like a miracle to me. So what types of miracles have you seen in your life? Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, well, you know, if somebody had had told me before my accident, you know, when I was just a child, that um, that you would undergo this devastating accident, but then you know, find a path forward despite you know, living with quadriplegia and then being on a, on a ventilator. Like, I don't know if I would have been able to understand that or like I would have if I don't know if I could have anticipated that for my life at all. Um, so I think that knowledge learning that knowledge is a miracle unto itself. Um, like having the, um, the understanding that, wait a second, life posts something as catastrophic as um, being hit by a car and being left paralyzed from the neck down. Uh, you could still find meaning in that life. Like that is a miracle in and of itself to me. But I think much farther beyond that, um, like any time I'm asked, you know, what I'm proudest of in my life. You know, there's many things that I could conceivably talk about, but what, I'm, what I think I am most proud of is, um, you know, the, the fact that my family was able to take a really difficult set of circumstances and say, wait a second, there is there is a meaningful life that can be found here. You know, we all, we all are going to need to modify and adapt and change how we view the way we live our lives, but there's still something very valuable and very precious to be working towards. And like that, I think, is um, what I am by far uh, most proud of. So I think you know, that is an additional miracle. And then, you know, 
so just this past weekend, I had um, my friends over. So my friends who I hadn't seen, many of whom I hadn't seen since before the pandemic, right? So a very long time. And when I was together with all of them, I I was very deliberate and intentional about telling how, telling them how much they are superheroes in my lives, true miracles in my life, and like the very uh, vehicles by which I've been able to get from one day to the next for all of these years. So they are um, you know, above and beyond almost anything else, you know, true miracles in my life. So I think we need to be really cognizant of the role that we play in each other's lives and how central we are to getting people from one day to the next. I couldn't agree more. Do you think that the best advice you can offer to family members and friends that might be facing a similar situation to what your family did is that you have to find the meaning, that there is meaning, there's value in that life, and that's the starting point to move for, up from? Oh, no question about it. Yeah, no question about it. And I think that is the, that is um, struggle number one, right? That is um, task number one when you're facing adversities, right, is to not let that feeling of adversity or the feeling of challenge subsume every part of your life, right? Like we hear about this all the time, and I certainly have experienced it myself. When you're facing challenge, you feel like it's it's just, it, it's, it has infiltrated all parts of who you are, right? It's just taken over your entire life. It's, it's hard to find a way forward in any capacity, right? It's just, it just happens so frequently, whether it's it's through uh, an injury, an illness, you know, the, 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 the loss of a loved one, it just, it just takes over. But for to have the ability to just circ- circumscribe that challenge, right? To compartmentalize it in whatever way you can and then look for the other ways that you can find meaning and purpose in your life like that. Is, those are like tremendous, tremendous skills in getting over the adversity or challenge that we face. Like absolutely goals, you know, one and two when it comes to, to fighting it, the challenges that we experience to say, wait a second, there is still meaning to be found in my life and I can actually uh, contribute to the world and the world can affect me in positive ways if I have that understanding. Absolutely. And it goes back to releasing those expectations because our despair comes from the fact that we believe different equals no meaning, no value. And right, when exactly. you can get rid of right? Yeah, yeah. Different is always uh, understood as less than, right? Or some kind of inferior version of what could have been when well, that's not always the case. And so, Brooke, if you could speak directly to physicians, healthcare professionals, caregivers, family members, what do you want them to understand about recovery, about what you've experienced and what it's like for you to get through a day? So I think that disability, um, for a very long time, on the, on the, from the popular level and certainly from the medical um, perspective as well is, is looked at from um, uh, the medical model of disability, right? Understanding disability to be a, um, a medical issue, right? Entirely, right? Some kind of medical diagnosis or a medical failure or some kind of part of a person's personhood that couldn't be fixed through a medical intervention. I think that that's, um, that's not all that helpful, right? There are many different um, social structures that um, we build is um, policies that we enact, um, uh, social supports that we put into place, technologies that we innovate that can can either um, enable somebody or further disable somebody, right? And like that is how we need to understand disability, right? It's not just a physical part of our lives, but it's, it's it, it touches on all parts of the social experience as well. And when we understand it that way, then you know, society has a really important role in how people get through the day. And I think that physicians are are often on the front lines or kind of the first points of contact when it comes down to when, it, when somebody has experienced uh, you know, a life-changing uh, disease diagnosis or disability, and they can help foster that belief that, wait a second, we're not just talking about you know, where your, your body is failing you or, or the deficits that your body is experiencing, but you, you can go on to do very valuable and important things if you understand you know, your position in the world to be a little bit different than it may have been before, but no less significant. Um, I think that we don't do that frequently enough. I think that um, uh, oftentimes members of the healthcare field 
understand disability and and uh, disease or diagnoses to be um, only in terms of deficit and only in terms of loss when that's not always the case and there are many opportunities to continue to, to make a difference in the world and to move forward. I think if, if physicians and healthcare professionals helped you instantiate those beliefs, then everybody would be better off. Have you ever faced a situation that was disrespectful or unfair to you? And, and if you have, how did you navigate it? Sure, yeah. So these are a couple of things that I talk about um, and were very difficult for me to talk about, actually, in the, in the pages of Look Both Ways. Uh, I think it's often the case that people with disabilities are treated um, as, like, children, right, infantilized in some way, not given um, credit for their accomplishments or not seen as valuable con- contributors to the workplace. And I experienced that you know, several times. Uh, you know, even you know, to this day, I continue to experience those kinds of things. So there were instances in which you know, I was you know, looking for, um, I talk very frankly about this in the book, I was <laughs> helping my brother find an apartment. You know, he, was, he had just graduated from college and was going to be staring, staying up in the Massachusetts area, in the Boston area, and we were looking for apartments for him. Uh, and uh, we were coming out of one of the apartment buildings that he was considering uh, you know, renting in, and there was a woman who came out of the apartment building and said, um, you know, uh, this we don't have we don't we don't uh, welcome people like you in this building, which I like at first I didn't even understand like what was going on like it was it was such an aberration such a such a a um a different and belittling experience I was shocked um it, it, I think. Uh, looking looking at that situation in hindsight, I have become a stronger person as a result of it. But I remember when I when I first encountered that, I had that experience. Like I I was um, speechless and distraught, and thinking to myself, how could somebody um, think that they had any understanding of my life without ever ever having spoken to me or or known me or how can somebody treat me with such disregard Um, and I know that many people with disabilities experience circumstances similar to that on a repeated basis and there have been situations in the workplace where I've been um, you know my work hasn't been valued as much as other people's work or you know um, opportunities are not afforded to me in the same way that they're afforded to other people right so these are I think um, common challenges that people with disabilities face because of how we have understood disability and the way we undervalue the lives of people with disabilities. Um, and it, like that is work that I am consistently trying to you know, build into who I am and to how I live my life to help change that narrative from disability or the experiencing of disability as some kind of weakness or vulnerability to one of strengths and mm-hmm. the kinds of virtues that disability, I think, um, engenders in, in how somebody approaches life. And Brooke, what about someone who goes through a challenge where they thought that they would fall in love and have a family? How were you able to navigate those issues in your life? Sure, yeah. So this is something I, that I, I spent an entire chapter of the book talking about. And yeah, before writing this book, I actually did never think that I would talk about or could talk about right? it's such an emotional issue uh, for everybody, um, especially somebody uh, you know, who lives with a disability and are, are often, far too often, um, you're not considered uh, those in whom people might find beauty or or love, and like that's something that I have struggled with you know, for a very long time, and uh, for many years of my life, I regretted that deeply. Like it, it was extremely self-conscious about it, or um, frustrated about it, and felt like you know, how we, why me, or why not me? You know, how come you know, I can't find somebody in for you know, to 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 fall in love with or who, who would love me in that way and um, that was a source of sadness for me for quite some time it was several years ago that I said wait a second 
if I understand love in only those terms, I am denying myself many of the manifestations of love that have given my life meaning and, and you know, made me who I am, whether that is you know, my love of you know, learning or my love of laughter, my love of my, my friends and my family, all of these sources of love that have given my life so much richness and color. And if, if I undervalue those, I undervalue my entire existence. Um, so, so although I don't experience the same kind of romantic love that I think many people um, understand to be the quintessential or even primary source of love in life, like that's not how I've had to experience it. You know, I, I, there's never a moment... Um, you know, when I I feel uncomfortable telling my friends how much I love them, or tell my telling my nephews, when I have five nephews, and I tell them as many times as I possibly can in the course of a day how much I love them and how much they mean to me, and the same thing with my family, and and um, you know, all the ways we experience we can experience a sense of fullness and completeness as a result of, of the love in our lives and like that was an important transition for me to make and that's of course not to say that I won't ever have these kinds of more traditional love based relationships but you know if that doesn't present itself I will not feel like I will have had a lack of love in my life. Brooke, in about 30 seconds or less, if you could speak directly to someone who's going through a challenge similar to what you've experienced, what would you say to that person? Uh, that you can, and that people have, and that you will, right? That, um, that challenges can seem all-encompassing, but you know, if we uh, focus on the ways that we can continue to find meaning in our lives, we will find it. And um, to not be encumbered by the things we thought made our lives meaningful, right? Because there's always a way to find meaning and purpose in our lives moving forward. The book is Look Both Ways. If you'd like to get more information about Brooke and her work, you can visit brookeellison.com. Brooke, thank you so much for spending this time with us. And thank you for being so open and honest about your feelings. You were talking about meaning in someone's life. You are definitely changing lives by sharing your story and offering hope. You know, you mentioned studying hope, offering hope to so many people. So it's really been a pleasure having you here and an Thank honor to meet you. Oh, the pleasure's been all mine, Joan. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.